All right, let's get started. I'm going to int introduce um, our presenter. Dr. Albert Menza is internationally recognized physician specialist in metabolic treatment approaches for patients with developmental, behavioral, learning, and mental health issues. He is the president and co-founder of Menza Medical, specializing in the treatment of biochemical imbalances associated with autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, aggressive and violent behavior, eating disorders, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, depression, childhood and adult schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. Welcome, Dr. Menza. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Ms. Dina. And to everyone who is participating in the webinar, I'd like to say hello and good evening. And by way of this brief introduction, I'd like to say that I am probably a world-class skeptic. Uh, it's amazing that I'm even in this field. However, several experiences uh, moved me in this direction, including seeing some things that I never thought would be possible, such as the treatment of individuals with schizophrenia and depression and bipolar disorder without medication and them doing better. In addition, autism, ADHD, and a variety of other disorders. Seeing is believing, and I had no choice but to believe what it is I saw. I proceeded to then give up a very lucrative contract in traditional medicine to enter the world we call biochemical imbalances and treatment through nutrient therapy. Well, let's go ahead and begin. Some very startling statistics. One in five children experience a mental disorder in a given year. One in 10 children, or 6.4 million children, were diagnosed with ADHD currently. One in eight adolescents have had an anxiety disorder, including post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and specific phobias. 10% of children, or 2.4 million kids, between the ages of three and 17, have a learning disability. 10 to 15%, or 3.4 million children and adolescents, have a depressive disorder. 8% of adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 have had a major depressive episode. 5% of children, that's between the ages of 4 and 17, have been reported by a parent to have serious difficulties with emotions, concentration, behavior, or just getting along with other people. Now, in the old days, that seemed to be nothing more than a, a minor, minor occurrence, and most parents just kind of let it go. But we're seeing that these are usually precursors to much more serious conditions. 4% of children between the ages of 3 and 17 have a behavioral or a conduct difficulty or conduct problems. Our clinical experience prior to 2008 goes to about 10,000 individuals with behavior and ADHD diagnoses. There are 4,600 uh, 4, autism patients, 3,500 schizophrenia and bipolar patients, and 3,200 patients with depression. Now, once again, you'll have to forgive us. We haven't had time to update our stats, but before 2008, these are the numbers that we're looking at here in terms of our clinical exposure and experience. Now, some out there may be asking, how can vitamins, minerals, and amino acids significantly help a struggling child or a teen? Well, the first thing I want to share with you is that the brain is a biochemical factory. You know, we sometimes move around the world with the misunderstanding that everything is just sort of present and ready in the human brain, and that there's no changes or adaptations or modifications. Actually, quite the difference. The brain is actually a biochemical factory. With the proper supply of building blocks, such as cofactors, the brain creates biochemical processes that are absolutely essential for normal brain function. Neurotransmitters, like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine are actually made in the brain. Now, some serotonin is actually made in the gastrointestinal tract as well, but for all intents and purposes, what we're sharing with you is that neurotransmitters are synthesized. They're made. They are not just showing up fully functional and ready to go. The raw materials for neurotransmitter synthesis include nutrients like vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. Based on genetics and epi genetics. Individuals are biochemically unique beings. 
a genetic or epigenetic imbalance in a nutrient can actually alter brain levels of very key neurotransmitters and result in an abnormal brain chemistry. By understanding the science-based biochemical biotypes, advanced nutrient therapy aims to heal the brain and correct the biochemical imbalances. Let's talk now about distinctive biochemical imbalances that are seen or exhibited by most individuals with ADHD, OCD, or other behavior or um, functional children, uh, childhood, adolescent um, defects. These include things like copper and zinc imbalances, overmethylation, which is actually seen by a blood test involving histamine. And in this case, the histamine levels would be low. Undermethylation is another one of the key imbalances, also tested by testing levels of histamine, in which case histamine would be high. There's also disordered metal metabolism, or what we call um, metal dysmetabolism. Toxic metal overload is also very prevalent in particular with elements like copper, but it can also be with elements like cadmium or mercury. Then there's pyrrole disorder, which for now would simply say tends to be a disorder of vitamin B6 and zinc deficiencies or imbalances. Let's look at copper and zinc imbalances to begin with. What are some of the traits or symptoms associated with copper and zinc imbalance? Well, certainly impulsivity, hyperreactivity, poor academic performance, temper tantrums, low self-esteem, high irritability, aggression or violence, sleeping difficulties, a prior diagnosis of ADHD, short attention span, tendencies to be in constant motion, verbal outbursts, bad or shall we say difficult behavior in school, high anxiety, a history of physical assaults on the more serious side, white spots on the fingernails, and even, yes, criminal behavior. Let's look for a moment at the critical role of methylation. Well, first of all, I want to share, people may ask, what is methylation? What is a methyl group? A methyl is actually a carbon molecule with three or four hydrogens associated. And these particular elements or molecules are very key in terms of regulating various situations in the entire human chemistry. Excessive nutrient overloads and deficiencies can actually disrupt methylation pathways in the brain. Let's explain a little bit here. The body's methyl groups actually turn genes off, or they can turn genes on, and they work by affecting the interactions between the DNA and the cell's protein-making machinery genes. Because the methylation cycle is essential for mental and physical health, basic nutrients for normal function of this cycle are absolutely critical. Too much or too little of any important methyl group can cause a methylation imbalance. Let's talk about the traits and symptoms of overmethylation firstly. Yes, indeed, hyperactivity, we see that again, high anxiety or panic tendencies, nervous legs or pacing, food or chemical sensitivities, sleep disorder, depression, self-mutilation. Many of these individuals are cutters, as the kids would say. Dry eyes and a dry mouth. That is a, a lack of capacity or a decreased capacity to produce salivary glands um, or mucus or salivation. There's also the tendency for a high pain threshold. Many of these kids are very similar to the goth kids that we see. Lots of piercings, lots of tattoos. Low motiv motivation in school absence of seasonal allergies, artistic or musical ability. Not all the symptoms or signs of overmethylation happen to be negative. Many of these individuals tend to be very gifted in many different areas, especially those that are very creative. On the negative side, however, paranoia can become quite prevalent, a belief that everyone thinks ill of that particular person. We can also see obsessions but we see obsessions without compulsions. What does that mean? It means that individuals may hyper-focus on given areas, however, they don't actually act on them. 
Well, where there's the, where there's the yin, let's talk about the yang. Traits and symptoms of undermethylation. Undermethylators can be very obsessive and, and compulsive in their tendencies. Now remember, the overmethylators were pretty much just obsessive without the compulsions. The undermethylators tend to be obsessive and compulsive in those tendencies. So they actually do things to sort of alleviate or try to alleviate that obsessive tendency. Here we see a history of perfectionism. Students or, or individuals with undermethylation tend to be very high achieving individuals. There's also the tendency for seasonal inhalant allergies, a low tolerance for pain, a prior diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. Ritualistic behaviors, we're kind of familiar with the wringing of the hands or locking of the doors or you know, repeated checking of areas that don't really need checking. Now, these individuals can also be very strong-willed. I know that kind of says, well, are we talking about kids in general here? Well, certainly. Um, but here with the undermethylators, we see a very, very strong propensity towards that. There's also a history of very strong competitiveness in sports. These individuals oftentimes have frequent headaches. You'll also see when you do a family history, this is very interesting, folks, you see a family history of high accomplishment. Well, my great, 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 great grandfather was a PhD, and his son was a PhD and an MD, and there's a JD, and they're all the D's, as I call them, all the advanced graduate degrees, all the academics, all these individuals who are extremely high achieving in either their um, academic progression or in their job titles, or job searches, or, or careers. Now, these individuals may present with a very calm demeanor, but they can have a great deal of high inner tension. Other traits of undermethylation include delusions in terms of thinking. Physically speaking, undermethylators are oftentimes somewhat on the more slender side, as opposed to the very thick individuals that we might see as overmethylators. Now, the reasons for that involve some chemistry that we're not going to go into yet, but there are certain phenotypic aspects to undermethylation and overmethylation. Let's talk about pyrrole disorder. Now, many of you out there have heard of pyrrole disorder, and it's all over the chat rooms and it's all over the internet, but let's speak specifically about some of the real characteristics and traits here. First of all, one of the classic signs and symptoms of pyrrole disorder is high irritability and temper. In other words, we see a lot of poor stress control. These individuals can be nervous, anxious, but what's really interesting is the whole idea of the mood swing. These folks can move from calm to rageful in a matter of a few moments to seconds. I call this the actual, um, in honor of the Avengers movie, the Bruce Banner Incredible Hulk Syndrome. These individuals can be rageful and calm back and forth throughout the entire day. Many of these individuals, unfortunately, have been misdiagnosed as being rapid cycling bipolar, when truly the key diagnosis or the true diagnosis was actually pyrrole disorder. They too can have severe inner, ten inner tension. Episodic anger is quite common. Depression is quite common. What's also fascinating is that sometimes we'll see a reading disability associated with pyrrole disorder. These individuals can react with a very short fuse. They can often have very poor short-term memory frequent infections on a physical level. Strangely enough, they can have a very difficult time tanning. Oftentimes they'll have poor dream recall, a history of underachievement. On the sensory side, these individuals can be very sensitive to light, sound, odor, as well as texture. In addition, we'll see poor wound healing. Now, let's talk about distinctive biochemical imbalances that are exhibited by most ADHD and behavior disordered individuals, children and adults. These include copper zinc imbalances, overmethylation, that is when they show the low blood histamine, undermethylation, disordered metal metabolism, toxic overload, and pyrrole disorder. Now, what we're kind of saying here, folks, is that it's not a one-to-one -one ratio of one imbalance creating one disorder many individuals are actually a blend of several of these disorders producing the specific symptoms that we see 
on a case-by-case -case basis. Diet and GI issues are very, very important. Food allergies and sensitivities are often quite key to behavior disorders and behavior challenges. Yeast overgrowth, for example, can be a huge, huge problem with regard to younger children. I remember there was a case that we had where there was a little boy who had been kicked out of four or five preschools before age five. After all the testing that we did and so forth, a simple yeast test showed that this individual was just yeast toxic. After appropriate treatment, this young man was doing extremely well and he's done extremely well ever since. No more getting kicked out of school. He's actually doing quite well. He's an A and B student today. But due to privacy issues, we can't exactly talk about that. On the other side, let's look at some of the chemical elements that come from our foodstuffs. The wrong types of foods can actually produce what we call caseomorphines and glucomorphines. These are elements that, if you look at the second part of each word, morphines, they produce an opioid or morphine-like effect. They make you feel good for a moment. However, after that moment is over, you crash. And that can often be seen with foodstuffs like um, casein or gluten, for example. For some people, it's high fat concentration foods that can produce these almost amphetamine-like effects with these huge drops. Dysbiosis or gut imbalance is extremely key in many behavior disorders. Now, many doctors out there will tell you, many scientists will tell you that, hey, there's really no correlation between sugar intake and behavior in children. Now, folks, for a minute, I'm going to talk to you as a parent. I'm also going to talk to you as an individual who taught preschool in his early years. After several hundred children and observation, not including my own, I firmly disagree with the concept that sugar has no effect. Sugar has a huge effect on behavior. Hypoglycemia, quite the opposite of the sugar high, we're talking about the lack of functional sugar in the system. And by sugar, I mean glucose. I mean the energy fuel of the, of the system. That can oftentimes create mood states that are not pleasant. Anger, rage, anxiety, irritability. Usually hypoglycemia tends to be relieved when someone simply consumes food of types, foodstuffs of some type or another. Then there's the issue of malabsorption or poor digestion. Absolutely key, if you can't absorb the foodstuffs that you have, it does a few things. Number one, you cannot break down the foodstuffs in order to produce the amino acids and the basic minerals that you need in order to make your neurotransmitters. The other side is that malabsorption can cause inflammation in the gut. Inflammation in the gut can also affect your body's system, your gut's capacity to make elements like serotonin. Not to mention that same inflammation moves towards the brain and can cause brain inflammation, which can lead to also cognitive deficits or processing difficulties or challenges. When we're talking about all these particular areas, we need to keep in mind that we have to look at things from a comprehensive perspective. We're not looking at one disorder, one imbalance and trying to treat it. We're looking at the entire gamut or the entire spectrum. A good comprehensive evaluation would include elements like hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Well, gee, Dr. Mensa, I thought you were talking about uh, nutrients, and I really didn't tune in to hear about thyroid disease or, or endocrine problems. Well, we cannot negate what is truly problematic. You have to check for the thyroid because, folks, let me tell you, the thyroid gland is one of the most powerful glands in the entire human system. It is a modulator like none other. If the thyroid gland is out of balance, it is going to overshadow any biochemical imbalance. If you do not fix, adjust, treat either a hyperthyroid or a low thyroid state, you're going to see very little progress with whatever the behavior is or the condition is that is pathological in the child, adolescent, or even the adult. Okay. You've also got to take a look at what is out of balance to begin with. Are we talking about nutrient overloads? Or are we talking about nutrient deficiencies? There's also the concept of metal regulation and metal dysregulation. 
Now, when we speak of metals, we're talking about, yes, elements like copper, elements like zinc, but the body is also very good at typically regulating elements like cadmium, mercury, or arsenic. Now, some individuals have a great deal of difficulty regulating those particular metals, and that's often due to either genetic defect or a functional defect or perhaps intoxication. Many people don't realize that in their own homes, they may be actually producing a metal dysmetabolism or dysregulation. How can that happen? I know some of you folks out there are thinking, oh yes, well, you know, your water can be a major source, your air. In the cities, we are exposed to tons and tons of metals in exhaust and fumes from cars and our factories and so forth. We often think that we're very safe at home, in our home environment. But for those individuals who have well water, for example, you can see tremendous amounts of copper present in well water. Individuals with copper pipes, the same thing can happen. The copper can literally leach into the water and be absorbed into your system. So day in and day out, all this exposure of any one of these elements can lead to actual dysfunction in cognitive processing. Let's look for a moment at environmental and epigenetic factors. When we talk about epigenetic factors, we're really sort of referencing elements that happen at the DNA level. And the environment reacting with the DNA is often what we're referring to with regard to epigenetics. Next, let's shift for a moment to gastroenterological issues that include food allergies, sensitivities, and malabsorption. All of them have to be taken in the whole. You cannot look at one particular piece and think you're going to solve a problem. We've seen so many patients, so many people we hear from, who have gone to specialist after specialist after specialist looking for, firstly, allergies, or maybe, secondly, malabsorption issues. But they have to be taken in totality. And this is one of the difficulties we have in seeing so many different specialists as opposed to the specialists coming together to work on a given case. Now, those kinds of things we see quite often at the county facilities, like specialist institutions like Cook County Hospital of Chicago or Mayo Clinic. Several great hospitals truly provide a team approach in approaching difficulties or challenges of a physiological nature. But what's interesting is that they've not done the same to look at biochemical imbalances and nutrient therapies, at least not yet. That's what we're hoping for in the future, folks. Well, next, in terms of a comprehensive evaluation, we've got a test. How else are you going to know what is going on in the human system unless you actually test for things like methylation disorders? You've got to check biochemical imbalances like pyrrole disorder, where you have a zinc and vitamin B6 deficiency. Believe it or not, and I hate to use that phrase, but early bipolar disorder can actually be determined by testing. Let's talk for a minute about environmental and epigenetic influences. Epigenetics involves the alteration of gene expression. We change the way the genes are actually sort of read, and this is due to chemical factors in the womb literally between days 16 and 21. The problem here is that those same changes will influence environmental factors and integrate with them throughout the life of that particular person. Now let's put this in a different way. If we think about somebody who's reading a blueprint, the blueprint is there to give instruction and someone reads that blueprint, whether it's an architect or an engineer or or a foreman in a factory. But now, if you change the blueprint, or if the person reading the blueprint misreads it, they're going to give different instructions for whatever product was supposed to be made, as opposed to the original product that was designed in the blueprint. So I want us to think about the human system, brain processing, as a wonderful, amazingly designed blueprint. Now, epigenetic variables come into play where they start to change the markers on that blueprint 
So the human system then starts to misread the original blueprint and starts making the wrong products, the wrong elements, the wrong chemistries that ultimately lead to a very different person. Epigenetic variables are highly influential in the production of certain cancers. They're very influential in the design and susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease, and certainly to elements like ADD, ADHD, and other behavioral factors. Every cell in our bodies has the potential to express any of 20,000 genes in our DNA. The product of gene proteins, or what we call gene expression, can be switched on or turned off. That is, the genes can be activated or silenced, or what we call bookmarking. Now, these epigenetic processes are truly more vulnerable to environmental factors such as radiation, temperature, dietary choices, toxic metals, viruses, stressful life, uh, stressful life events, and, and a variety of, of other causes here. Now, I know someone out there is thinking, well, wait a minute, you said earlier between day 16 and 21 of pregnancy, why well, I, I didn't know I was pregnant or my wife didn't know we were pregnant at that time. How do these things happen? What I want to share with you is that it's typically not any individual's fault per se. These are, are micro regions of a system that we're still learning about. And we know that different parts of the womb can actually have different environments that will affect the development of the embryo. Twin studies have been a great, great, great revealing variable here when it comes to the study of epigenetics. As we see twins developing very differently, and I mean identical twins. Remember, these individuals should have been really the same person. But why is it that identical twins who were once the same entity now are either slightly taller, slightly heavier, um, slightly more different than the other twin? A long time ago, we used to think, well, this was due to perhaps too much blood going to one twin um, from the placenta and not enough blood going to another twin. But no, it's not that. There were epigenetic variables in one part of the womb that changed forever the development of one twin versus the other. The next idea we want to talk about is more or less about environment. Overstimulation. We've got busy classrooms, but we know classrooms are busy. What about at home? Television, toys, electronics. I call this electronic noise from a variety of levels. All of these elements provide too much of a stimulation for some of our children, and it can easily affect their capacity to certainly sleep, and therefore their capacity to wake up refreshed, their capacity to process. We might even be training our children to become hyper vigilant. In short, how can they focus if they're being systematically trained by everything around them to have a very, very short attention span and then to move on to the next area? Now, one of the areas that's very con uh, controversial right now involves electromagnetic field radiation or EMF exposure. The really interesting thing is that when my colleagues in medicine um, take a look at a home and they see that there are these big giant wires in the back of the house. Most of them go, oh no, 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 we're not going to have anything to do with this home. We've got to look for something else. Yet at the same time, these same individuals might have difficulty with the idea that electromagnetic frequencies and waves can actually affect our learning behavior and development. Okay. Right now, this is a field of tremendous study. However, there are many individuals who report that even with their cable TV and their cable boxes on at night in their homes, it disturbs them. For many, it's the light. For some very interesting individuals, it's about what they're picking up or sensing. There's a certain frequency shift or change that is interfering with their ability to process. Now, I know someone's thinking, well, Dr. Manso, that sounds like a whole lot of science fiction hooey. Well, Let's back up for a minute and think about the human body. You know that if you take a comb and create some static charges and put it up against your hair, if you're a hairy guy, for example, on your arm, you, your hair will stand up. 
Well, it does that because of electricity and magnetism. Every cell in the human body is designed such that there's a movement of ions, that is, positive charged elements and negative charged elements between the outside and the inside of any given cell. Those shifts in ions create a certain level of electrical activity. That electrical activity has a very strong relationship to magnetism. If you're still disbelieving, then you've got to ask yourself a question. What is an MRI test? Where you go into that hospital and you get in that big tube and it scans you up and down and produces a picture. That picture is based upon actual fluctuations of what we call dipoles or molecules at a molecular level. In other words, that machine is reading magnetic traces and it produces a gorgeous picture of muscle, bone, nerve, tissue, and blood. The picture is far better than an x-ray and more in depth than a CT scan. Folks, that's based upon magnetism. If we didn't have some level of magnetism, we would not have MRIs right now. So if we can influence pictures or create pictures based upon magnetic variations and, and fluxes and shifts, doesn't it seem logical that certainly outside variables involving electromagnetic fields could, and I'm saying could here, could influence us at a molecular level and therefore our sleep, our behavior, our differences, our similarities. Lastly, I want to talk about vitamin influences. We don't think about this too much because most of us are taught that vitamins are, well, they, they, they're somewhat minimal, they're not all that important, you only need them in very small amounts. These are sort of the buzzwords that were given to us while we were in medical school. What became very telling for me was to find out that they are far more important than anything that we've ever seen or considered before in terms of how our brain works and how difficulties or challenges arise. These same vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and so forth are necessary cofactors. They are pieces, very important pieces that influence the production of neurotransmitters, that influence actual DNA repair or DNA development or protein development. Now, this can be both positive and this can also be negative. One of truly the things that I hate to say it that really just sizzles my biscuits, folks, is that so much of what we thought was benign. We decide, well, you know, if there's a little bit of this vitamin here, why not add a little bit more? Now let's put it into our foods. Now let's put it into our cereals. Now let's put it into our grains. Let's enrich, let's fortify all of our foodstuffs with all of these supplements. Now here's the difficulty. We did not realize that these particular elements were as powerful as they are. For example, methylation disorders can be heavily influenced by folic acid, by acetyl groups, by methyl groups. The problem is that the more folic acid we take in, if we're not careful, we can actually throw off the balance between our acetyl groups, methyl groups, and other elements and actually create the very problems we're concerned about. Methylation disorders, influenced by folic acid, influenced by several other minerals, are often very key in the production of depression or behavior disorders. So we really have to be careful and not assume that vitamins are benign. Quite the opposite. Vitamins have true power. And because of that, I don't like using the term vitamin. I prefer to use the term nutrients because these nutrients can be very key, they can be devastating. I would suggest strongly that you not look at the use of higher concentrations of supplements without biochemical testing and evaluation first and without talking to a very, very good practitioner well-versed in these particular modalities. These vitamins can actually cause a great deal of damage in terms of behavior or even in terms of physiological symptoms. 
cardiac issues can be exacerbated by the wrong vitamins. Bleeding disorders can be exacerbated by the wrong vitamins. A variety of things that we have to be careful about now. We're learning so much, but the more we learn, the dumber we realize we are, the smarter we become. So let's overview this process. The first thing you want to do, or I should say we want to do, is to do a very thorough physical examination. Next, we want to have a very extensive patient history. And that history is not just about the, the patient alone. It includes family members, going back perhaps a few generations. Next, we want to do specialized lab testing involving blood and urine. Then we want to check diet and gastrointestinal issues. Then comes sort of the key elements here. With all that testing in place, now we want to prescribe advanced nutrient therapy protocols. We want to do these at the appropriate therapeutic level in order to target the individual patient's specific needs in order to correct the underlying imbalances. Folks, this is not a one-size-fits-all phenomenon. Just as different as anyone listening to this program is from anyone else, we know that treatment must be individualized. You cannot just provide a total treatment protocol that is rubber stamped in nature. Folks, that's why we fail in traditional medicine right now when it comes to behavior, when it comes to ADHD, when it comes to all these things. We're looking in the wrong places. After the treatment begins, then you've got to follow up, okay? Many folks out there tend to feel real good after they've begun their treatments and they forget they've got to be adjusted. There's an ongoing monitoring period here. And that's key. Make sure you are in good contact with your nurse or your physician with regard to follow-up care. Well, I wanted to try to get through some very key points fairly quickly in order that we could move on to questions and provide some good answers. Because I know there are a lot of folks out there with a lot of questions. Dr. Menza, one of the questions I received is, what is the average time before symptoms improve when a child is on your nutrient therapy? Oh, that's a very interesting question. And it's hard to answer in particular because there's so many different causes for behavioral disruption. Now, let's say it's something simple like pyrrole disorder. A child who's just purely pyroluric and that is the main cause of their symptoms and challenges can do better in as little as three months. They can actually do better in as little as a week, but the range tends to be somewhere between one week and three months of treatment. Now, for an individual who's copper toxic, you have to be careful because if you remove copper too quickly, that copper can reignite a lot of receptor sites in the brain and the body, producing a worsening of symptoms before they get better. So with copper, you want to try to remove things very slowly, and that process tends to take roughly about six months or so. Now, methylation disorders, they're a little bit more tricky because now we're talking about actually working at the level of DNA. Methylation disorders tend to take somewhere between nine months and 12 months if we're talking about undermethylation. Overmethylation tends to take somewhere between eight months and a year. So there's a little bit of overlap, but there's a great deal of functional uh, variation here. So the real answer is that it tends to depend on what the actual imbalance is or what the combination of imbalances are. As we said earlier, several different imbalances can contribute to the challenge that a particular child has. So you might here actually see some things improve in sort of a stepwise fashion. Bit by bit, changes here, changes there. Maybe it's the anxiety that improves first. Maybe it's impulsivity improving second. Maybe it's fatigue improving later, or maybe even focus or perhaps even language development. Each one of these things will shift at a different point in time depending on which imbalances are truly the key reasons for the, the imbalance or the, the, the challenge to begin with. How do you go about treating uh, thyroid issues, uh, Dr. Menza? Okay, now that's a, a very good question and here we have to talk about traditional medicine. Okay, I know a lot of people don't want to hear about that, but the thyroid gland is a hormone and I'm a very brass tacks person. My goal 
and I think every doctor really wants to get a patient as healthy as possible, as quickly as possible. I am currently not aware of any nutrient therapies that are going to affect thyroid hormones and shift them as accurately and as quickly as actual thyroid medication. Now, there are bioidentical hormones, there are a variety of things out there, but whatever you're using, the, it, it's still going to function like a hormone or like a hormone um, extractor, irrespective of what you want to call it, if it's going to work, because that's the only way you affect hormones. Most of the time, what we recommend is that your primary care physician check your thyroid levels and then prescribe the appropriate treatment regimen and then monitor you sequentially. Now, we're not talking about seeing multiple physicians. We're talk talking about now the physicians working together. What we typically do is that when we discover that someone is hyperthyroid or hypothyroid with our testing, we actually ask to speak to the primary physician of the patient in question. So we want to make sure we're all working together and we're all on the same page so that they understand what we're doing and how we're progressing and that we're all on the same page with regard to the treatment of the patient. Has social behavior improved at all with kids in ADHD and ODD? Social behavior with kids who have ADD and ADHD with treatment, yes. I'm sorry, with ODD and ADHD. With, with oppositional defiant disorder and um, ADHD, certainly with treatment, behavior does improve. That's one of the ways that we monitor progress. Now, what's interesting thing here is that we monitor progress through changing of the chemistry that we monitor sequentially as well as behavior. So unlike with traditional medicine, we're not just asking the question, how do you feel? We're actually able to see changes in the chemistry that will tell us that we're moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. What laboratories do you use for specialized testing? Hmm. Quite typically, um, we use LabCorp. Uh, we've determined that LabCorp really knows how to process uh, a lot of these specialized tests the best out of uh, any of the labs out there and available. Now that's us and what we do uh, and for our purposes. But typically speaking, we move through uh, direct healthcare access to labs. They tend to coordinate everything relative to different labs throughout the entire country, and in many cases around the entire world. Can you um, explain how folates influence undermethylated children and if one of the symptoms of undermethylation is, in, is, is anxiety? Oh boy, that's a loaded question. Okay, let's go backwards. Yes, one of the symptoms of undermethylation is anxiety. How do folates influence? Okay, individuals who are undermethylated are low in methyl groups. Okay. As a result of that, they are challenged to be able to modify enzymes, hormones, or neurotransmitters. An all too common misconception in the medical world involves the role of folic acid and how it functions. Folic acid is considered by many to be a, an excellent donor of methyl groups. So when individuals here, they're over, under methylated rather, they be told, well, take folic acid because it will help methylate you. Well, now, what we've come to understand is that that's not entirely true. If you draw a picture of a cell and you have the nucleus of the cell, the core of the cell where the DNA is located, folic acid works differently in the nucleus of the cell versus inside the rest of the cell. Outside of the nucleus, folic acid is a great donor of methyl. It does provide methyl. But in the inside of the nucleus, where DNA sits, where your blueprints are, folic acid actually removes methyl. So what we're seeing here is that for somebody who is truly undermethylated, the last thing they need is large amounts of folic acid. It will make them worse. Now, this is not just um, philosophical thinking, it's not just somebody's research study. We've been doing methylation for over 50 years in our field, and we've seen this empirically. That is, patients on average who are put on these folates, 
while being undermethylated, they do tremendously worse. So there's a very important role and a very important caution around folic acid and folates. Because first of all, how many people out there really know their methylation status? So we've got folates in vitamins, we've got folates in enriched foods, we've got folates in processed foods, we've got folates everywhere. Not to mention in many of our diets, rich in folates. Yet if you are an undermethylator, you're wondering why no matter what you do, no matter what you try, you don't get better. You just seem to stay where you are, you just seem to be moving in the wrong direction. The odds are you've got the wrong nutrient influences in your system. This person at, is asking, is there any connection between ADHD issues and migraine? We have a strong history family of both. One child is more severely affected by ADHD, the other has chronic daily migraines. Have you ever treated both in combination? That's an excellent question. And in actuality, one of the key commonalities between ADHD behavior and migraine headaches is actually copper toxicity. Many individuals who are copper toxic tend to have both migraine headaches as well as ADHD or focus and attention problems. So folks, copper is a neural stimulant. It affects a nerve cell by itself with high amounts of stimulating activity. The other thing is that copper pushes the pathway, the biochemical pathway of the conversion of dopamine into norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is your fight or flight neurotransmitter. So when you add copper to the system, every system that involves norepinephrine, what we call the alpha-1 and beta-1 receptor sites, gets stimulated. Excessive ongoing stimulation can certainly produce headaches and migraines because you've got constant neural stimulation. The nerves are actually being affected. Not to mention, if all those brain cells are being stimulated, well, where's the focus and attention going to be? It's going to be very difficult to do. So one of the key things that we can see is a connection between copper, ADHD, and migraines. And you know what? You're right. There is a genetic component. Individuals who have a copper dysmetabolism or difficulty in regulating copper levels can pass that on to their children. Quite characteristically, we see this with women and postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. Women who have difficulty with menstrual irregularities, with fibromyalgia, with fibroid tumors, with um, endometriosis, very physical things in nature. These are related to copper, but these same women also will have depression, anxiety, and yes, migraine headaches. Their children can often be oppositional, especially the young boys because of copper toxicity. And the young girls may also suffer from early depression or anxiety and may also see fibroids and, and other elements such as that. So there's a very strong correlation between many biochemical elements and ADHD and even physiological symptoms like migraine headaches. Is it possible to test for low stomach acid and how do you treat for yeast over, overgrowth in the gut? Hmm. The answer is yes, it is possible. Um, the question is, is it really necessary? And it depends on the individual. Um, a lot of the doctors that I consult with who are asking these similar questions, you know, I, I kind of ask them if they've done a, a simple pH probe test. Okay. Now, the question is, why do you want to do the testing to determine what the acid pH is in the stomach? It's very, very case specific. And, you know, the real simple answer is that you talk to your primary doctor about your specific question because the last thing you really want to do is to artificially affect the pH of your stomach. The pH of your stomach is very well balanced in order to allow the enzymes in your stomach to do their job. See, enzymes don't just sit there and function optimally at any given pH. They require a very specific pH to work. So before you go around probing, no pun intended, um, with acid challenges in the, in the stomach, First, you need to find out exactly what's going on and is it really necessary, and if so, what the treatment is going to be. Now, part two of that was... Um, yeast over overgrowth. Uh, you got. Yeast overgrowth is actually not a difficult treatment in theory, but moving through the process can sometimes be challenging. Um, you can use elements like nystatin or caprylic acid, but once again, you don't do this on your own. First, you've got to have real testing to first show that there is yeast present. 
Okay, then you've got to really be concerned about the potential for yeast to die off and your physician will help move you through that process because when kids start to have that yeast die off, their behaviors can actually become a little bit irritable or erratic. And the reason is that not only are the yeast dying, but when they die, they release chemicals that are inflammatory agents. And those inflammatory agents can produce more chemical releases that can lead to behaviors that will affect both mental processing, excuse me, that will affect mental processing as well as behavior. So on paper, it's not really that difficult to treat yeast and dysbiosis, which is why it's been so, it's been sad that it's been so overlooked in many a, a pediatric population. Part of the challenge to treating them is that the very foods that most of our kids and teenagers want to eat, those very foods are doing nothing but feeding yeast. A lot of the sugars, a lot of the carbs, a lot of the, uh, the breads, the, the wheats and so forth, a lot of those things can actually feed yeast growth. So on the one hand, while you're trying to kill the yeast, we're busy feeding a whole new population and generation of yeast. Yeast do not die quickly. Most of anything we use to kill yeast will affect yeast during a reproductive cycle of yeast. And yeast reproduce very slowly. So it becomes a, a bit of a challenge functionally, but on the paper it's really not that hard. It simply involves persistence and understanding of what to expect step by step. Do you work at all with brain scans as Dr. Amen does to see what scans are over or under the active? We don't directly. We often receive actually quite a few uh, patients who have um, brought with them scans with regard to um, the different conditions and so forth. What scans do is that they tell you basically level of brain activity or where certain elements may be. It, they don't tell you how to correct them. Now, it's kind of like looking at a picture, but you're not looking at the molecular level where the corrections need to be made. So scans can be useful, but at the same time, they can't do much without the real molecular assessment, which is where we focus most of our attention. It's like we see that somebody's undermethylated the scans might be telling you where that might be affecting in the system, but it's not going to be corrected by the scans. So you've got to really deal with the chemistry and shift that in order to see the real shifts and changes. Now, what might be useful someday is to do a pre-biochemical treatment scan and a post-biochemical treatment scan. And I think that's coming pretty soon. Question here. So why are all these folates in our foods, Dr. Menzel, this folic acid? And what do you recommend that we do about it? And that in a, there it's in our multivitamins. It's in everything. Well, this question is, is, I ask myself that same question all the time. My goodness, what are we doing? Part of the problem is that we don't know. And I mean this as a society. I mean this as scientists, as manufacturers. Most do not know. We're, they're only beginning to scratch the surface with regard to methylation disorders. See, the idea here goes back to the, to the point that folic acid is very important in preventing neural tube defects. Folic acid is very important in methylating outside of the nucleus. So as far as we were all concerned, you know, folates, 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 and the more the better. If a little bit is good, why not take more? Well, as we gained understanding from the great Carl Pfeiffer and from Dr. William Walsh of the Walsh Research Institute, we began to see, now wait a minute, what have we been doing, for example, as we thought about at Mensa Medical, what are we doing to our pregnant mothers? First, we knew we wanted to prevent neural tube defects, so we decided to give folic acid for the first three months of pregnancy. Then we said, well, if three months is okay, six months is probably even better. And now remember, neural tube defects are only an issue for the first three months of development. After that, your brain is pretty well formed, so it's not an issue. But then we decided in our almighty wisdom, or shall we say in our almighty silliness as a medical community, that we might as well just go ahead and give prenatal vitamins all the way up through the end of pregnancy. Then it was while you're breastfeeding. Now remember what we talked about earlier in the converse in this discussion. Folates can strip methyl. We talked about undermethylators and overmethylators. We know that methylation can be both genetic and epigenetic. 
So if indeed we've got a mother who's pregnant, how do we know that that developing embryo, fetus, child is not an undermethylator? And yet we're giving folic acid consistently throughout pregnancy and even through the breastfeeding years. Are we actually changing the bookmarks? Are we actually producing some of these very disorders that we're concerned about, such as ADHD or autism? These are very disturbing questions, and quite personally, I'm very disturbed by what it is I see, the rampant usage of all types of nutrients and elements in the system, both in our foods, in our supplements, with reckless abandon, because we think we understand, but we really don't. It's going to take a great deal of education, and I believe that we are on the cusp of that. Um, a lot of doctors, a lot of practitioners are armed with this information. I think, though, the real key is going to be the population of people who are listening to programs like this, who are proactive and are asking questions that force the medical community to alter their perspective or to at least reevaluate what it is we're doing. Because, folks, I can tell you, autism is now 1 in 50. I know this is not a conversation about autism, but, you know, how is it we went from, no, oh, maybe a decade ago, where we saw autism in the one in the thousands, to all of a sudden one in 500, to all of a sudden one in 110, all of a sudden one in 88, then now it's one in 50, okay? The issue is not it's a matter of simple gene variation and, and genetics. Genetics doesn't work like that. A gene mutation takes millions of years. We are artificially doing something. We may not know what it is yet. It may be a combination of variables, but we are artificially influencing the environment of the womb during gestation that's producing all these elements. I think what's really being taught to us by all these conditions, if we listen, behavior disorder, ADHD, autism, childhood schizophrenia, the message that our children are giving us is that we need help. We have to stop doing what we're doing rethink everything we're doing and make some changes for the sake of the next generation and the generations of humans to come. We have a couple of questions now about copper levels and how, how do you reduce copper overload and is it actually possible to bring the level down to someone who's never had copper toxicity? I'll answer the, um, the last question first. The answer is yes, we do it all the time. Okay. Um, how do you treat copper? Now, I'm not going to give you specifics on that because I don't want anyone out there trying it on their own. But as we talk about nutrient therapy, the way to treat copper dismetabolism or, or copper excesses is through a complex of nutrients and supplements that will indeed bring out the copper. Okay. We're not talking about external forms of chelation. That can be dangerous. Unless somebody is extremely, extremely severely copper toxic or lead toxic or iron poisoned or something like that, should outside chelation be attempted. Now, I know there are plenty of practitioners out there who do chelation. Our institution disagrees with that because there are internal or endogenous ways to do that that will not cause harm. Okay but we're talking about using a complex of nutrients to do that. So the same way we're talking about advanced nutrient therapy, that's how we treat copper dysmetabolism and copper excesses. This person is asking, it is my understanding that chiral disorder can cause hypothyroidism. Which do you treat first? Pyral disorder does not cause hypothyroidism. Um, people may see a coincident hyperthyroidism but no, pyrrole disorder does not cause hypothyroidism. Um, our institution has been treating pyrrole disorder for over 50 years. Uh, and that is to say, our field, our, our, our practitioners. And uh, Dr. William Walsh of the Walsh Research Institute, uh, a leading authority on pyrrole disorder. We're not too bad ourselves. We've treated thousands, and this is no exaggeration, thousands and thousands and thousands of cases of pyrrole disorder. The problem with the internet is that sometimes there's disinformation that gets spread. 
and we can certainly tell you pyro disorder does not cause hyperthyroidism. Let me share with you though where the confusion comes in. Any form of stress can actually increase pyro molecules. Stress can be physical, it can be emotional, or it can be physiological. Now hyperthyroidism is a physiological state or condition that adds stress to the system and consequently pyrroles are going to manifest. Sometimes folks will get correlations confused. You can coexist, you can see a pyro disorder in any condition. You can see it in hypercortisolism, you can see it in, in major depression, you can see it with, with simple growth. Look at our teenagers and our toddlers in the two-year age category. These are areas or times of extreme physical growth. They oftentimes have white spots on their fingernails, which are oftentimes a sign of, of pyroluria or pyro disorder. Well, how do they behave? Calm a moment, anxious, rageful the next, out of control. We know what teenagers are like. Most of us were teenagers at one point in time or another. And the fact is, highly unpredictable, emotionally charged, they're pyroluric. There are many, many conditions, anything from cancer to menstrual dysregulation to tumors to um, growth to emotional breakups can produce a stressor that can produce pyro disorder. So we should not confuse what may be coincident chemistries and physiological states for elements that are causal in nature. Okay? Pyro disorder doesn't cause hyperthyroidism, but hyperthyroidism might cause pyroluria to erupt. So it looks like we're getting a couple questions about foods, GMOs, processed foods, and what types of dietary inter interventions such as a gluten or dairy-free diet, the fine gold diet, mm -hmm. is there a typical diet that you tend to recommend most? That question comes from a very learned person, and I, I thank whoever sent that question out there. Um, I'm, I'm rather, I think I'm becoming fairly infamous for saying this. The first question you need to ask is, who are you as an individual biochemically? That's what determines the type of diet you should be on. Now, we've all heard, well, you know, eat a, a, a low-fat diet, a more plant-based diet, a more this diet, a more that diet. Let's make a distinction between the physical body versus cognitive processing and the brain and the mind. They are not one and the same. What is good for the body is not necessarily good for the brain and vice versa. We know that uh, plants, fruits, and vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, plants, they are extremely good not only for their vitamin and mineral capacity, but they also scrape the colon as they travel through the bowel. In other words, they get to those nooks and crannies where, unfortunately, inflammatory variables, un undigested meats, things along those lines may sit, and they actually help to clean the colon. So there's a mechanical process that's very beneficial there. But if you happen to be an undermethylator, living on a diet of plants and vegetables could provide way too much folic acid and make your condition even worse. Now let's talk about the other side of this. If you're an overmethylator, then that may be the exact diet you need to be on in order to have a wonderful, fulfilling life. There is no one size fits all when it comes to diet issues and when it comes to individuals who've got pathologies, especially children with ADHD or behavioral disorders. Casein-free, gluten-free diets really should be relegated to individuals who've been tested and who know that there's a challenge. Now, one exception to that is really the children in the autism spectrum. These individuals are typically undermethylated, and about 60% of them are sensitive to casein and gluten. So without testing, one can do a casein-free, gluten-free trial and probably get some decent results. You want to kind of decrease that caseomorphine and glucomorphine effect as you, you kind of remove the, the dietary variable of inflammation from their systems. Because that's what these particular foodstuffs do. They ultimately create an inflammation that makes brain processing worse or different. The fine gold diet is actually a very good diet. It got a bad rap, unfortunately, because of um, 
the the actual research paradigm in which it was used to to sort of prove its point. Somewhere along the lines in the development of that study, the individuals who put it together used the wrong variables and so the outcome came out incorrectly. However, the fine gold diet with proper utility is actually a very good diet. The key here is, once again, who you are, test first, then find out what is the most appropriate match for your chemistry. That's the real key towards dealing with, now we're talking about cognitive issues. We're not just talking about somebody who's happy-go-lucky, living out there free and you know, in the world with no problems. We're talking about folks who've got behavioral challenges, focus challenges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything from sugar and carbs to yeasty foodstuffs, predecessors of, of caseomorphine, glucomorphines, all these things need to be evaluated. And I hate to say it, but our teens and that teenage diet, hard to control, but boy, is that ever a challenge. And that's one of the areas that also needs to be regulated. Fats, pizza, burgers, fries, these are all pre-depressants. They're only pre-depressants because you've got to eat them first, and then you can become depressed or anxious or foggy in the brain. What used to be a weekend event on the outside has become a multiple servings a week kind of a phenomenon when it comes to teenagers. Hard to control, I know, but right now let's just talk about identifying the issues and then treating them after that. Okay, we have a couple of questions about testing, so I'm going to con compile them together. Do you recommend any genetic testing to examine uh, methylation status? Do you um, basically do all of these blood tests and urine tests confirm the existence or non-existence of all the disorders you discuss, and where do you go for these tests? Great questions. And I, I think the person who asked at least one of those questions has done some reading or had, had exposure to genetic testing for undermethylation or methylation period. And that involves the MTH of FR test, the methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. Now, folks, let me share with you that firstly, there is not, as of yet, a comprehensive panel of genetic testing to accurately show you who you are as a methylator. I know some folks out there are going, well, wait, all the doctors, all the practitioners are talking about um, the MTHFR, and you know, if you've got a homozygous or if you're heterozygous, you know, a uh, bump in the system, then you know, you're undermethylator and you need folic acid. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute, okay? I want to share with you that the MTHFR gene represents one enzyme out of 12, 12 minimal number enzymes in the methylation cycle that are relevant. It is not a test that gives you the synthesis of activity of all 12 enzymes. It is one test for one enzyme, okay? So it is not an accurate marker for methylation status. Actually, the whole blood histamine test is the most accurate reflective marker we have right now for methylation. And I know people out there say, oh, yeah, I heard about that, but that was done 20, 30 years ago. Well, you know, we did it for one reason. And then after all this science and evaluation of methylation and gene testing, we found out that that's actually the best test to use. It is the most accurate up until now until we modify the SAMe-SADH ratio, which is in progress it is still the best test to evaluate the sum total of activity of all the enzymes in the methylation pathway. The MTHFR, on another hand, remember it's one enzyme, but it's also a molecule that has 77,000 base pairs. When you talk about a SNP, whether it's heterozygous or homozygous, you're only talking about one or two base pairs out of a 77,000 molecule enzyme. That's like saying that you've got a big semi-truck with 55 wheels on it, and if one of those wheels comes off, the truck isn't going to be able to drive anywhere. Not correct. That is a total misconception. That enzyme will continue to function even if it does have a SNP or two. Okay? The, the studies around this are very interesting. Now, it's not just Mensa Medical saying this. It's not just the Walsh Research Institute saying this. Mayo Clinic and Harvard have both done studies and evaluations of the MTFR gene and testing. And they agree with what it is I've just shared with you. So we've got four institutions here 
of reputable note, uh, if we do say so ourselves, that our agreement about how this particular molecule or, or enzyme is working and the true significance. Now, the origins of the whole MTHFR genetic testing really go back to autism. Now, in 30% of autistic children, that is actually a very significant test, okay? And so is the treatment protocol. But it's 30% of autistics. I hate to say it, but some level of monetary mm, fiduciary capacity has come into play where they've tried to expand the real validity of the test into the general population. Folks, it doesn't work like that. Um, for what it's worth, you can do an MTHFR test, and I've seen this, I've had many a doctor come to me and say, you know, I don't understand, we've done this methylation test, and I've given the treatment and my patients don't get better. And I'll share with them, well, did you do just a simple histamine test? They say, well, you know, I did, but we got these, these strange results. They were, they were counterintuitive, they were opposite each other. And I said, well, the histamine test basically tells you what all the enzymes are doing, and here's the end result. The MTHFR test is showing you what one enzyme is doing, and at best, the question is, is it really defective or not? Because, once again, it's a gigantic molecule, and one or two SNPs is not going to affect the activity outside of children who are on the autism spectrum, and by the way, who also have high homocysteine levels. Okay, so genetic testing is interesting. We're actually working on a greater evaluative process involving more of the enzymes in the methylation pathway and genetic testing. But right now, up to snuff, there's just the one, and that's not significant enough to actually change how we do or what we do because we know from well over 40 years of practice in methylation how this tends to result in what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Can you explain why there's a heightened sense of smell and sensory issues in these individuals with these disorders? Well, I, I'm assuming that we're referring to pyrrole disorder here. Um, first of all, sense of smell is very individualistic. And zinc is a very important variable in not just inflammation and wound healing, etc., in many of our faculties. When we are zinc deficient, it throws off many of the processes that would ultimately lead to neural activity and the receptive nature of smell sensors. Okay? So many individuals who are pyroluric will certainly have a heightened sense of smell. So when we have extreme agitation, depression, growth, fear, irregularity, rage, whatever the outside influence is that's creating a pyro disorder, you will certainly see some manifestation of sensory aberration. That aberration might not just be smell, it might be extreme sensitivity to light. When I was younger, I used to see some individuals walking indoors with sunglasses on. And I thought, oh gosh, aren't we feeling pretty good about ourselves? We, we think we're movie stars. Why are they wearing sunglasses, you know, uh, inside the room? Well, looking back on that, the assessment might very well have been outside of the, some physical uh, disorder with the eyes, such as dilated pupils, they might have been pyroluric because these individuals are very sensitive to, to light. They're also sensitive to odor. They're also sensitive to touch, tags on clothing, seams on socks. Does any of that sound familiar? How many of our two-year-olds will walk into the room, as soon as they get home, they strip down nearly butt naked and they're running around with just their undies on with no socks, or in some cases, nothing on. This comes from the sensitivity that is produced to, to touch, to clothing, to a variety of things that is basically the result of pyrrole disorder. What are the ranges for whole blood histamine to determine if someone is over or under methylated? Huh. The ranges that we use um, for undermethylation tend to be over 70 uh, micrograms per deciliter. And for undermethylation, they tend to be somewhere between 40 and 30, so underneath those two. That would be overmethylation. So we're talking pure numbers greater than 70 by our standards and less than 40 for undermethylation and overmethylation, respectively. 
And for under and over methylation, do they both or either one show low glutathione levels? Oh, excellent question. The glutathione levels are not really reflective of methylation as much as they're reflective of a greater process in the system or, or, or larger process in the system. Glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant and so it's used in many oxidation reduction um, reactions in order to stop things like free radical damage, in order to stop inflammation or to help decrease it. See a lot of its use in autism and a variety of other disorders uh, along those lines. But people sometimes get a little bit confused or they question the relationship between glutathione and methylation. Glutathione and methylation do not have a direct correlative. Indirectly, let's just say they're on the same team fighting the same villains, just in a different way. Have you treated with B12 shots and how long term? What do you test to know if they need this for? B12 injections, that's a very um, interesting question as well. The answer is yes, we have used B12 injections, but the question is why do you want to use the injections? For older individuals who are B12 deficient, certainly that is one of the most cardinal ways that anyone who has actually no particular difficulties whatsoever but is low on B12 will get their B12 through the injection process. But you can actually take vitamin B12 in one of two forms, either the methylated version or the cyano version of the CN B12. Now, the difference is whether or not you're an undermethylator or an overmethylator. Yes, indeed, once again, though, that methylation process will determine which form of B12 you're going to do better on. Methyl B12 injections, on the other hand, are quite commonly and characteristically used in speech and language delay, not only with children who are on the autism spectrum, but children who may have a, a, a typical development in many ways, shapes, and forms, but simply are language challenged. Um, they may also have PDD-NOS. They may also have um, a variety of issues stemming from some poor maturation or lack of maturation in certain parts of the brain. Methyl B12 injections have been shown to be of great utility in advancing language and speech development in children. But it's the methylated version of B12, and they are injections, not the oral version, not the nasal version, that are best in terms of creating the changes that are needed. So once again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It depends on who you are, the condition you're treating, uh, but yes, methyl B12 injections or methyl B12 or cyano B12 uh, can be very, very important in the treatment of many of these conditions. I know this is not having anything to do with our ADHD or ODD or OCD conversation, but why is it that autism is more pervasive among boys than girls? Because girls are smarter than boys, I think. Um, <laughs> that is a, that's a very good question. And one of the things that we know is that in the development of, of the human brain, and uh, Dr. Walsh of the Walsh Research Institute has got the world's largest database of biochemical imbalances and, and, and brain specimens of individuals who were in the autism spectrum category. And he determined that when we're looking at actual development, typically brain cells develop in two directions. They come from the top to the middle of the brain and then from the bottom to the middle of the brain. And it's what, it's what we call somatotopic organization. Now, what we've seen or what we can understand is that in individuals who have autism, the nerves don't quite meet in the middle where they're supposed to. They're, they're further out, they're further spread apart. We also know that individuals who are autistic, with reference to males versus females, have very specific, different challenges biochemically. Many of these brain studies will show in females higher incidences of copper versus higher incidences of calcium dysregulation in males, or other elements, excuse me. Um, in either event, we know that calcium is extremely important in that developmental process. But I think that we're, what we're really seeing is a greater susceptibility of the male brain due to epigenetic factors as opposed to the female brain. So yes, indeed, you women have known it for a very long time. Go, go, go. Um, women are, females are probably stronger entities epigenetically 
than males are. Although I'll just say as a male, probably not by much, but nonetheless, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that. There are indeed epigenetic variables at, at, at root here, but we know also that in development, boys tend to catch up. So that's pretty much the, 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 the simple, if you can say there is a simple, but the more simple variation of a, excuse me, the more simple explanation of that. Excellent. Now for a child who doesn't have severe behavioral symptoms um, or mild ADHD, what are the benefits of still going through biochemical evaluation? Well, part of the real benefit is to fix the problem. Medication, now let's just ask this question. If it's not a problem, don't fix it. That's number one. Okay. We oftentimes have family members coming and saying, well, you know, my child is this. I'm wondering if I, if I should be tested or treated. And my first question is, well, do you have any challenges? Do you have anxiety, depression, anything along those lines? And they say no. And I say, well, you probably really don't need to be evaluated. Okay. If your child is getting along, if they're doing okay in school, if it's only something minor that isn't a real problem for you, if it's not a, if, hey, if your teachers, your child's teachers did not bring this up, then you probably don't have to worry about it, okay? If you see a condition worsening, though, and, and here's the real deal, sometimes what you see as mild behavior and mild challenges at one age will get worse over time. So it might behoove you just to go ahead and get your child tested or evaluated just to see where you're starting from and what's going on biochemically. Because if things get worse later on, this is something you could potentially nip in the bud very, very early. Okay. Now, if your child is on the way to college and just had some mild issues you know, throughout high school or, or uh, grammar school, but they got A's and B's, well, no, I'm not going to worry about that. And I would say you shouldn't either. But it's for those people who have some real concerns, something telling you, hey, little Johnny, little Sarah, something's not right there. And I need to really, I think I need to get that checked. I have to say, Dr. Menzo, you're doing such an awesome job tonight. I know you we're giving you so many questions. One question from an attendee is several of the conditions we are talking about tonight, ADHD, ODD, anxiety, OCD, increased sensory sensitivity are also thought to be symptom, symptoms of pandas or slash pans. Is testing for infections that may be contributing to these issues also a part of the comprehensive evaluation? Yes, to be very simple. And I started to say yes and no, but I changed my mind. The reason why I was going to say yes and no is because many of the patients who actually come to us have actually already had a diagnosis of pandas. And so we work with these particular diagnoses in addition to the biochemical testing. Now, some patients have come to us and they have questions or concerns that maybe there's a PANDAS issue. And we do indeed test for that ourselves. So in either direction, we work with and around those situations. But here's the deal. We know for a fact that there is a very strong correlation between these biochemical imbalances and indeed the symptoms that are being described. This is nothing new. This has been going on for well over 50 years. And with treatment, these individuals improve with only these nutrient-based therapies without having taken any antibiotics or anything else to treat any other condition. So statistically, I can say we can tell if there's a biochemical imbalance, there's a strong correlation and it needs to be treated. Now. If you've done that, if you've appropriately treated the chemical imbalances and there's a PANDAS diagnosis and the, the kids are still having those symptoms, then the question is, has the PANDAS side been handled accurately okay, or significantly? So there's sort of a, a, a double play there and, it's, and there's an interplay, but it's not going to be one of confusion if there are some biochemical challenges present. We know statistically which imbalances cause which symptoms and which combinations can produce certain symptoms. So it might be a little bit confusing because pandas also, as, an, as a disorder of inflammation, as a disorder of, of um, outside etiology, namely uh, a bacterial influence, um, these things can produce stress on the system. And remember, we talked about earlier, stress of any type 
can cause pyro disorder. Once you produce a pyro disorder, you can also set into play a string or a sequence of other imbalances that arise. Okay, so whether it's physiologic, whether it's um, biochemical, whether it is environmental, we'll call viruses and bacteria environmental insults, they can work together to create greater dysfunction, but certainly there's a way to segment the approach to evaluate which is causing what. Could pyral disorder be mistaken for schizophrenia in a young teen? How long does it take to see major improvement if this is the cause? Oh, amen to that question. Pyral disorder is one of, let's talk about schizophrenia for one, for one moment here. Um, I love that concept of schizophrenia in all of its errors and inaccuracies. Why? Because now we've come to find out that schizophrenia is not one disease. It's not one disorder it's actually several different disorders with similar symptomatologies and similar overlaps. But here's the deal. When we talk about these things, and this is direct from the Walsh Research Institute and from the original Carl Pfeiffer Institute in New Jersey, the BioBrain Balance um, Clinic, there are three distinct biochemical types or biotypes of schizophrenia. There is the pyroluric schizophrenic, there is the overmethylated schizophrenic, and there is the undermethylated schizophrenic. Now, what's very significant, and here's why we fail in traditional medicine to get results other than just masking symptoms and blunting individuals when we're treating schizophrenia. We think it's one disease, one disorder, so we treat it with just drugs. On the other side, when we now test and we can see that this particular schizophrenic actually has undermethylation as his predominant uh, mechanism that made him susceptible to the stressors that converted him to a schizophrenic state. Now we can treat the undermethylation and help to move this individual back into normality. The same for overmethylation and the same for pyro disorder. Now the other part of the question is that these three disorders not only are treated differently but the timing in which we have resolution, or let's just say improvement, the timing in which we have improvement is also very different. Pyroluric schizophrenics tend to do better much faster than the overmethylated schizophrenics. The undermethylated schizophrenics tend to take the longest in terms of time to improve. But there are very specific biotypes. Also, believe it or not, about 5%, I'm going to stop saying that, believe it, about 5% of schizophrenics are actually there in that condition because of dietary allergies and sensitivities. 5% have an actual GI cause of their schizophrenia. And when those issues are taken care of, resolution tends to occur in most of these folks. Now, I know someone out there is thinking, oh my goodness, where did all this stuff come from? What about medication? The unfortunate thing is that now that we have our atypical antipsychotics elements like Seroquel, Abilify, Risperdone, these elements have created a very negative effect on the human brain. The longer an individual has been on these particular medications, what we're finding is that it's actually decreasing our capacity to use pure nutrient therapy to achieve full resolution. We're seeing that we're getting partial resolution we're getting some levels of improvement, but if they've been on these medications, it's making their lives much more difficult. Not impossible, but much more difficult. Oh. For children whose lab results revealed he elevated heavy metals, what is your preferred method of removing those heavy metals? Hmm. It will depend on what the metals, which metals we're talking about. You know, one common misconception, uh, we always classify metals as, you know, one category of heavy metals. Each metal has a different personality and a different way that it acts, a different way that it reacts, and a different level of sustainability in the system. In general, we can use endogenous stimulation of, of anti-metal regulators in the human body to actually help to remove those metals. It doesn't always have to be outside chelation. Now, don't get me wrong. If someone shows up 
with lead poisoning, you take that person to the emergency room and get that stuff out right away. Same for iron toxicity. Okay, but if we find that somebody has cadmium that's elevated or or something else in terms of a, a metal, there are different ways to literally remove them from the system endogenously. That is from with the system within to the system outside. It does not have to be one always of, of, of drug therapy. At what age should you test your child even if they aren't showing specific symptoms? Well, I struggle with that one and the reason why is because I, I really do operate in the realm of if it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, if your child is developing well, um, doing okay, you know, why bother, really? Um, live a happy life, be blessed, be happy. But if somewhere around two and a half, your child seems to be a little bit too perky, a little bit too spunky, or not developing properly, or has got some uh, challenges or delays, certainly get them evaluated. We at Mensa Medical, we do not test any children younger than two and a half years of age um, for a variety of reasons. Um, specimens are often difficult to acquire. Um, maturation, um, genetic maturity, a variety of things, but typically the youngest we really sort of had as a rule of checking would be about age two and a half. Is it possible for under-methylators with pyral disorder to have an underlying endos... End, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this word. Endocrine. Endocrine derangement, yep. Oh, absolutely. The question was, um, individuals who may be under-methylated and pyrolytic, may they have, is it possible for them to have an endocrine problem? Yes, absolutely. Remember when we kind of first went over this, what I was trying to get across and what so many people don't understand is that it's not a point by point by point discussion one to one of this is the imbalance and everything that's happening is because of that one imbalance. We're dealing with a delicate balance of human physiology, physicality, environmental influences, biochemistry, and physiology. Endocrine imbalances are physiological in nature, and they can certainly cast a major shadow over any biochemical imbalance. Why? Because these are hormones that we're talking about. And remember what we said about thyroid hormone before. Thyroid hormone, um, hormones for the pituitary gland, hormones for the adrenal gland, any of these can cause amazingly challenging problems, even with an underlying undermethylation and pyroluria. In fact, they'll make the pyroluria worse. But the key here is that it's the endocrine system that has to be dealt with. Everything from diabetes to hypercortisolism to uh, a variety of, of elements from the pituitary gland, pituitary tumors, um, adrenal gland, adrenal fatigue, all of these things have interplay, but they're very, very important and they must be dealt with quite swiftly before any terrific damage is done because of a, either an unfound condition or an untreated condition. Very, very important, the endocrine system. Yes, but the two are not mutually exclusive. Biochemistry and the endocrine system, remember they all work together. It's all one human body, all one cognitive being. The systems can influence each other positively or if there's a dysregulation, it can be quite negative. Explain why undermethylators are very allergic or reactive to foods. This one goes back to the histamine aspect of this. And reactivity to foodstuffs or to, to anything really involves a hypersensitivity of the system. And that's what is manifest with high histamine. It is a hypersensitivity and overreaction to not just food, it could be to environmental stimuli, it could be to cold. It could be to, to heat and, and hot temperatures. I know people who simply can't stay in a nice warm shower any more than five minutes um, simply because it will cause an immediate histamine response because their system is super sensitized. So what we're seeing here is a characteristic of undermethylation, but it's not 100%. Okay? 
probably more like 40 to 60 percent of undermap leaders have such sensitivities. Now then, when we see an undermap leader with that sensitivity, we say, okay, there's another manifestation. But there are many undermap leaders who don't have such sensitivities to food or other allergens. But if they have high histamine or severely high histamine, then these individuals tend to be more in the 80% category where you're going to see sensitivities to environmental stimuli, allergens, or foodstuffs of one type or another. We have lots of questions coming up about chiral disorder. Um, what about the constant stress and anxiety chiral disorder causes? How do we overcome the adrenal fatigue? What is the optimal ranges of zinc uh, for labs, for references, for, for zinc and B6 for chiral disorder? Okay, I'm going to take each of those questions one at a time, so I'm going to ask you to repeat <laughs> the first one, please. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. How do we overcome the adrenal fatigue from the constant stress and anxiety pyro disorder causes? Okay, I want to be very clear. Pyro disorder doesn't exactly cause the stress and fatigue. It's stress and fatigue that causes pyroluria. That pyroluria then, as it depletes zinc and vitamin B6 and causes increased oxidative stress, now chimes in on this vicious cycle that will not only worsen the pyroluria but starts to affect other symptoms as well or systems as well like adrenal fatigue. Okay, The adrenal glands are functioning in and of themselves trying to keep up with the stressors that are influencing the body. The pyroluria is a reflective marker of oxidative stress. Folks, if, if you don't get anything else out of this conversation, I want you to understand pyro disorder is as much a marker as it is anything else. It is a marker, and its most powerful role it is a marker of oxidative stress. Stress, as we talked about, that's physiological, biochemical, environmental, whatever have you, growth, development. It is a marker as to the kind of suffering the body is dealing with. Okay? It does not cause these other disorders. These other disorders are there because of the vicious cycle of which pyro disorder is a part but it is not necessarily causing those other situations. What was part two to that one? Part two, is there, an op are there, is there optimal levels for labs of zinc and B6 or comparative results for chiral disorder? Yes, um, optimal levels tend to be anywhere between 90. Well, actually, optimal levels will probably be somewhere between 98 to um, 140, okay, functional range. Now, this is what we would consider to be um, a good functional range for zinc levels at Mensa Medical. Um, when we talk about vitamin B6, folks, unfortunately, there really is not a very good test for vitamin B6 levels at this point in time. People do test for vitamin B6, but they're not as accurate as the tests for, say, vitamin B12 are. When we see a vitamin B12 level, we're pretty confident that that, by our modern technical ways, is doing very, very well. The vitamin B6 right now is hard to evaluate. That's why we don't actually use a vitamin B6 test, because there is not a good, or shall we say, a very sensitive and specific test that's extremely reliable <laughs> to give you good vitamin B6 levels. They're out there test-wise, but it doesn't mean that they're actually telling you what it is you really want to know. In terms of in terms of accuracy, is having a high IgE and histamine the same? No, they're not the same. Um, IgE is a variant of five different immunoglobulins that are part of our immune system, and each immunoglobulin, as we call them, has a very specific function. IgE as a test is usually telling us if there's an allergic phenomenon or, I hate to say it, if there are parasites involved, you will see elevated IgEs in a given individual. Now, it's not the same as histamine. Histamine is a chemical. It is a chemical that is released from a mast cell or a basophil, and with that release, it acts like the first domino in a, a wonderful domino diagram. It knocks over the first chemical 
that knocks over five or six other chemicals. And each one of these chemicals is what we call a mediator in inflammation. It is the key element that starts a process going. That's why we take antihistamines like Benadryl when we are often sick or are having a huge um, immune reaction because we want to stop the histamine before it gets the whole domino effect moving in the entire system. IgE is a reflective marker. It is an immunoglobulin that does have a function in terms of telling us about what particular elements may be at root in terms of causing the inflammation. Histamine is a chemical. IgE, IgG is a molecule that is made from basophils or white blood cell type entities. Okay, two different things. Ooh, this is a really good question, Dr. Menza. Does one's blood type influence how quickly or slowly one responds to biomedical treatment? Sounds like somebody who read Dr. Walsh's book um, or someone who read uh, Eating for Your Blood Type or I guess Living for Your Blood Type. Um, back in the old days, we actually thought that blood types A, O, A, B, and B each had a very significant role in in how people respond not just to diet but to um, changes in, in therapies for nutrient imbalances. Currently, we have to say that those have become more myth than reality, with one exception, and I, I hate to say this, but with type A blood, there still seems to be some validity that type A responders tend to move a little bit more slowly to various nutrient therapies than individuals with different blood types. So that one seems to be holding the test of time here, but the other ones really have no real correlation anymore. In thyroid testing, emphasis is on TSH level. Is, our, is your testing for thyroid thoro and basic lab work? Well, let me just share with you. The reason the uh, TSH is actually um, what seems to be prevalent is because it really is the first marker that's used by traditional medicine to determine if further probing is necessary. Now, if further probing is necessary, then they'll typically do a T3, a T4. Some individuals will push harder to do an RT3, that is reverse T3, um, et cetera, et cetera. What we've come to see is that typically with the patients that we have, it is quite often necessary to delve a lot deeper. So we may start off with a TSH, T3, T4. But remember, every single one of these tests costs money. And we don't want to inappropriately cause people to spend more money than they, need, than they need to. So we can order a thyroid panel for individuals who we feel require greater testing, but quite oftentimes we'll just use the, the typical marker of just a TSH. Now, many individuals will also come to us and say, well, listen, I'm pretty sure I've had a thyroid issue, um, or in the past, you know, my doctor said I was hypo, then hyperthyroid, or this, or my Aunt Lucy or Cousin Fred had a thyroid issue. Now for these folks, we're going to start the process off with a more thorough thyroid evaluation because the TSH is not going to be necessarily an accurate enough indicator. You can have a normal TSH uh, and a, an off T3 or T4 or both, but if you just test the TSH, you'll just think that the person is doing quite well and there's a different cause. So for those kind of folks, we do more thorough evaluation. Otherwise, quite often, we're just starting with a TSH. But note I said starting with a TSH. If we believe the thyroid condition is present after further evaluation, we will go ahead and dig deeper. Those with pile disorder often have trouble sleeping. Any advice? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and we get that question a lot. And it's not just people with thyroid disorders. Um, Undermethylators, overmethylators, any methylator, normal people. Issues revolving around sleep are different between children and adults. Um, for adults, there are many life stressors that are coming into play that makes it hard to get a good night's sleep. Um, for children, believe it or not, if they're having trouble getting to sleep, uh, as my colleague Dr. Bowman would say, uh, she's big in, in terms of GI issues, Maybe there are critters at work here, meaning perhaps there needs to be a check for um, stool for ova and parasites done through 
any physician at any lab will do that one for you. But there can be sometimes parasites at work that can make sleeping difficult um, for individuals who are not with behavior disorders, elements, and I'll just put this out there, um, lots of lovely natural remedies like inositol or GABA or L-theanine can be helpful. Lots of people will, will use several different types of nutrients, but you know what? If you actually get tested, you can actually determine which ones might be of better utility for you to try as opposed to just trying either a mix of everything or several different things. It's also dose dependent. You can't just go out there and pick up you know, these natural supplements um, without knowing appropriate dosages to use. They can be different for every individual, but certainly you know, if, you, if you talk to a lot of professionals out there, what is going to tell you, um, L-theanine for overmethylators, GABA for overmethylators, and isotol for undermethylators, Sometimes it's a combination of the two. Sometimes it's none of the above. Without real testing, it's hard to pinpoint that. Okay, but you've also got to check environmental factors. Are we watching TV late at night? For anyone who's ever had a collegiate student staying at home or a graduate student staying at home, they're working till late hours in the morning, and then they wonder why they can't sleep. Well, their brain has been on fire for you know uh, successive hours just before it's time to go to bed. So we've got to modify our habits as well. Okay, Our kids really should be trying to get to bed at a decent hour, but don't let them participate in things that are going to be stimulatory within 45 minutes of sleep. They're not going to go. And the same for us adults. While many of us have TV in our bedrooms, you know, unless we're watching a really, really, really boring show, um, it's going to be hard for us to sit down and, and watch a good comedy and then expect to fall asleep. So dietary variables, we've got to change some of those things. Environmental issues, biochemical testing, I know it's probably a, a greater answer than the question that was posed, but there are far more levels, more layers to sleep challenges than, than we often think. And I can tell you that one of the most frequently posed difficulties for any patient who comes into our office is I've got sleep challenges. Despite my anxiety, my depression, my whatever, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, sleep is one of the most common, I would say about 85% prevalent challenges in terms of symptom reports that patients come in with. We've got questions now about patients coming in on medication. So does a patient go off their meds before testing, and do you take medications into consideration when testing, for example, you know, SSRIs? The answer is yes and no to both questions sequentially. Now let's break that down. Um, we do take medications into account. No, we do not want any patient to stop taking their medication. One of the, the beauties, one of the best things about advanced nutrient therapy is that it can work in conjunction with the medication. See, medication is acting like a foundation for individuals for whom their foundations have crumbled or are in the process of crumbling. We don't want you to get off of them and remove that foundation while we're trying to build new supports for the condition that's present. We need that foundation to stay solid and level until such a time as chemistries have improved, have balanced, and like wet cement, have had a good chance to dry and harden then we can start talking about removing the medication. But no, you do not want to get off your medications. Most people will crash or do far worse than they were before if they all of a sudden get off those meds. You don't need to be off meds in order to test. Okay, That is one of the most important things I want anyone to remember. Don't try to remove the medications yourself. Don't start a nutrient therapy program. It doesn't matter who you're working with. And then think you're going to get off the medication right away. It doesn't work that way. And if you're talking about ADHD medication, that might be a different story. But if you're somebody who's got anxiety or depression and you're on an SSRI or you know, a tricyclic antidepressant or any typical antipsychotic, no, you're not getting off that medication right away. Be very, very careful. All right, we're now we're on to a little bit, we're going to veer from children questions just for a moment. And we're going to take just a few more questions here. It's um, 
just about uh, five minutes left here, so please submit your final questions for Dr. Menza. You're doing so well, Dr. Menza. Thank you so much for being so great at answering everyone's messages that are coming in here. Oh, we're doing our best, Dana. Um, one person is asking females, women that are under methylated, could their symptoms of PMS be exacerbated, uh, you know, during menstruation? Are there the symptoms of, of under methylation around their period? Around their periods, all symptoms and all chemistries are exacerbated. Um, but let me share with you, it's really the copper toxic female who actually is the most susceptible to severe PMS issues. Um, premenstrual dysphoria, uh, irregular menstrual bleeding. Many of these individuals also have fibromyalgia. They also have um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, anxiety. All these things go along with copper. And so when we're really talking about biochemical testing and evaluation, there's a woman who presents and says that, you know, I've had this lifelong history of, of all these symptoms and my periods, it's really horrible around my periods. You know, hey, this is a red flag. And then the next question is going to be, I hate to put this one out there, but are we taking any oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapies? because any one of those that contains an estrogen component will increase copper levels. When you increase copper levels in these people, in these individual people, their systems can't get rid of it quite so readily. And so the copper levels build up and they become neurotoxic. They create inflammation in the body. They create oxidative stress. They create GI issues. They create uh, fibroid tumors. Folks, Copper is needed in order to make blood vessels. That's the piece I want to share with you, okay? That's why when a woman is pregnant, her estrogen levels rise. They don't rise because the hormone has nothing else to do. Its function is to bring in copper. Copper is like the bricks with which you build the building of the human baby. They are necessary to make blood vessels. And that's where the commonality with tumors and fibroids comes in and cancer. Blood vessels need to be made in all of those in order for a tumor, blood vessel, anything, excuse me, a tumor or a fibroid to actually grow. So high copper levels will cause irregular bleeding, will cause all those things because of a process we call angiogenesis, the development of blood vessels. And when you are a female who has copper dysmetabolism, who cannot break down copper, that's when you develop these types of other situations, including postpartum depression, severe mental irregularities, et cetera, et cetera. And that can lead to severe depression, severe anxiety. We've seen far too many women, uh, or heard the stories rather, who, of women who, you know, after their third or fourth pregnancy, walked off of a building. They're the ones you've seen on or heard about in the news where they've turned their shotguns on their children, their spouse, Many people say, well, I understand the spouse, but you know, what about the kids? And then they kill themselves. These women were postpartum psychosis individuals, and 85% of them are copper toxic. So if you really have severe menstrual uh, challenges or, or premenstrual dysphoria or anything along those lines, I would actually consider looking at copper toxicity before I'm considering undermethylation as being a severe undercurrent. But yes. Anything that affects mood, which certainly high copper levels can, will certainly exacerbate undermethylation symptoms.